Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, I, I didn't want to spend an hour being a talking head, so uh, but I but I felt like you maybe it was a good thing to sort of get a little bit of background about who I am, so you sort of understand uh, purpose. I usually start with why and go backwards to how and what, but. Um, and so we'll do a little bit of that. I also thought that maybe it might be interesting to just sort of see my perspective on, on, um, on, on where, where we're going with corporations in general and social entrepreneurship more specifically. Um, it's interesting because as soon as you said something about competitions years and years ago, we did one of those competitions at Georgetown where they introduced, I'm a Georgetown alum, by the way, you can hiss now, uh, but, they, but they, they, where they introduced the social aspect. And, at the, and I was one of the finalist judges, and then they asked me to speak after. And one of the questions was, where, you know, what, where, what, what do you hope for in the next five years? And I said that there's no distinguishment between a corporate track and what I actually said is a social track and an anti-social track. But that's just me being cynical. But really, in all honesty, like that, 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 that these would be merged together. And in, indeed, it's probably been like six or seven or eight years, and I'm seeing much more of it. So it's probably interesting to talk a little bit about that. But before I do, let me just tell you a little bit about how I got started. I, I was a Georgetown grad. I worked, I did what most people do, especially back then when you're in a school like Georgetown. I'm sure GW may be a lot like this, but if you're a finance major, everybody wants to work for Goldman Sachs. And if you're an accounting major, everybody wants to go to work for PwC or whatever, right? Or McKenzie if you're a consultant. And so I was really no different. I went there to do social justice law and um, ended up you know, with student loans. I had a depleting scholarship, and so to get, to get there. And you know, before, before I knew it, I just got caught up. And I, I, I never like to say it this way, because it sounds like I almost wasted time. And I don't believe anything that I ever do is a waste of time. Uh, but um, I spent about nine and a half years. And, and during that time period, I just sort of emerged as the Securities and Exchange Commission guy. Like we're all of the big international companies that were in DC, we would do the workforce. So it was basically going quarter to quarter. Back then, you not only did the annual filings of the 10Ks, but the CPA firms did the 10Qs. And honestly, it was, you know, there were a lot of things that made me realize I was probably not in the right place. Uh, but the, 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 certainly one of it was the idea that these good friends of mine that were the CEOs of these companies, after all these years of working with them, every quarter were under pressure to just get earnings per share up. If they had a really bad quarter, we would wait to release results so that we can report on the next quarter. You know, but basically everybody, John Toops ran PRC, and one time he... He, um, you know, he, I was I was sitting in the in the in the back office, and there was staff in the front office, and I was talking to one of the partners, and I heard John leave and said, "What are we up to in earnings per share, kid?" And he said, "Well, we're a buck, we're we're at a buck fourteen, Mr. Toops." And he said, "Well, keep running the calculator because you ain't getting out of here until it's a buck twenty-one." And the truth is, is that we didn't leave until it was a buck twenty-one. And um, later, when in talking to John, it was always about like, "Well, I lose my job if not." So. We really were, were in a stage, and we still are in a lot of ways, that our job as corporations are to drive money to shareholders. It's the single most thing that we do, right? And I thought, there's got to be a different metric for success. And so I'd like to think that I had this grand vision, and I'd like to tell you that I really just saw it, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but that would just be a lie. Um, I left and started completely on my own. Um, and what happened was is that people like like Forrest Mars, Mars was one of my clients. Forrest referred me to a wine store he had, he had um, invested in. So they all wanted me to be successful. And I ended up going out to these businesses. We were now these tiny mom and pop shops. And it was the same thing. I want to make more money. I want to save money on taxes, right? So it was like, oh my gosh, I just traded this high prestigious job for these people that are like, you know, just. And so I said, what, you know, what have I done? So that was about the first eight months of my wonderful new practice where I was making no money and being more miserable than I was before. Um, but I, I, I had this revelation. I, I won't tell you the whole story about why, but it really was sort of where I thought I'm start. I just I'm defining myself as being an accountant as opposed to really what my true purpose is. And back then I used to call it why, like the why. Now I call it purpose. But it really was around like what is what's my bigger purpose? And my bigger purpose was to affect community. So I just scrapped everything. I unloaded all these clients that I had on another CPA firm, a friend of mine that had started his company. He said, take all these clients, and I started over again. And my mission statement at that time, this is back in 1984, was to be a catalyst for positive systemic change in our community. Now, 
I give a lot of speeches, and when I open up with that, like at the AACPA conference, everybody's like, who is this guy? Like, that's what CPA firms do. But again, it's more around purpose. And so back then, in 1984, there were no social businesses. There wasn't a word for it even. CSR was not even a word. So it was really more around working with nonprofits because those who were those were who was positively affecting. And my means to the end was like Jim said, it's I had this skill set of doing accounting, and I said, well, if I help them to do their accounting better, then their mission will be better, right? And so the practice, long story short, was built around that. People would come to me and say, I really want to do something more important. And I said, well, what do you do? Well, we do HR. We do finances. We do technology. We do, I mean, all sorts of things. And I said, well, just come here and let's help build it. And so the practice has been built up. It's really diverse is all of the stuff that we do. We have a bunch of different companies. We have an insurance company, a wealth management group. And it, but it's all around that same purpose. It's all around saying, well, how do we advance community? Right? So not everything that we do advances community, but I can tell you most of the time that's what happens. So now you, now you look at it and say, well, we're about 350 professionals. You know, it's a large company. It's got all these different companies in it. But the, the truth is, is what's happened probably in the past 10 years is that these, is, is around these social ventures. And so we've become very, very much involved in for-profit social ventures that, and, and trying to connect in a lot of ways the nonprofit communities with the knowledge that exists in some of the entrepreneurs that are social ventures and vice versa, looking and saying, look at the models that are the nonprofit models and see if you can make some dollars on them. So um, what, I, what I want to do next is probably just tell you a little bit of my sense of history, which is, which is definitely probably not the perfect sense. It's more of an observation than any, any study. I'm not really big on, on, um, on, on, acad on, on the academics part of what I do. In fact, there's a guy, Mark Kramer, that has written on um, uh, uh, catalytic philanthropy. He used us as a model. And he called the catalytic philanthropy, I swear, because we had, the, we had our mission statement that said to be a catalyst for positive systemic change. Then later he wrote on uh, collective impact, and then he wrote on, on, he wrote on shared values. All great articles, all in, I can tell you where they all are, some of the social innovation. And I always say to Mark, uh, you know, I do it and you write about it. And he certainly writes about it almost better than I can do it. And it does sort of pass this and, and press. But if you, so... Don't, don't really hold me to timelines and everything, but one of the things, when I started a company in India, I spoke with, um, it was, it, what happened in India really quick is about a year and a half ago, they legislated this change that said any company that's chartered there has to give away 2% of their EBITDA to philanthropic purposes, right? So we had somebody that was a retired chief justice from the government, we had somebody that was from a nonprofit, and we had somebody from a corporation. He was from Tata Industries. His name was Jacob. And then I summarized the conference, and there was about 130 CEOs there. And that kicked off this new business where we're trying to look at these corporations and help them to direct their dollars so they don't see it as just another tax, but that they use them effectively, right? Um, so I, I learned a lot about Tata when I was there because I wanted to know these guys before I spoke. And if you, if you don't know, Tata is like, I, I just looked today, so I would have some academic stuff behind it. I think it's the 49th largest con uh, company in the world. It's certainly the biggest in India. Um, they employ over 600,000 employees, and they do about $110 billion a year. But Tata was more than just an entrepreneur. The guy that started this back in the late 18, you know, I think it was around 1896 or something, or a little bit, 1868, um, he was really committed to, to philanthropies and, 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 and to, to being a philanthropist, and it was the basis for his whole company. Um, so he looked at societal needs, and he said, what does India need? They need education, they need health, right? And so he built his company around that. And the interesting thing is, is that even today, when you look at the company, the distinctive nature of what Tata is even today is, is that a huge part of its assets are held in trust. Um, and uh, they, they, devout, they, they, they basically devote that, those trusts devote uh, the plowing money back into the social development initiatives that are out there. So I say that because when I think about what we do in our company is exactly the same thing. I don't spend a lot of time telling people they smell so I can sell them deodorant. I look for societal ills and I look to fix them. And I honestly believe that they could be monetized. And so the success of our company, like I was looking at statistics today because I'm speaking next week at a conference, and I've been asked to speak there. It's 25 of the largest CPA firms. And, and so it's not, a big, it's not a big conference. It's more like a meeting, and it's in, it's in Cabo. So I get to go to a good place to do this. But um, 
They're interested because basically I looked at our statistics against the other companies that were there that was run by this thing called IPA, which rates all of the CPA firms, right? And so we had like the largest rev net, net income revenue growth. It was like 48% last year. We had the highest revenue per partner. We had the lowest turnover. And so people want to know why. And they think that I'm going to tell them, well, you've got to work your people hard. Like all the standards, like you've got to look at the billable hours. We don't pay much attention to hours. We look at impact. It's a really unbelievable model and hard for CPA firms, especially, or a law firm or anything that is in that mindset to follow. So I completely understand that because I started this and sort of hit on something, not visionary, honestly, just sort of hit on something in the early years, that now I see all the success. It's a, to me, it's a proven model. Okay, so you know, to be a B Corp that's a CPA firm, very unusual. We got our B certification from the B Labs, and I can explain to you what that is. You can just ask me later, and I'll remember to tell you about it. You know, back 10, 15 years ago, we were the only CPA firm in the world that had a certification. Okay, these are companies like Ben and Jerry's, right? Uh, uh, Patagonia, all these. These are companies that were built for this, right? They rate you from, you know, you got to, in order to be certified, you got to get 80 and above. They rate you from 80 to 200. We were like 130 something. I don't know. You can look it up and find out exactly what we were. But we beat like Panagonia, which was actually one of my goals last year. Um, so, and, 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 and it's the only reason why I even say that is because it's, it, people could look at it and say, it's a model that doesn't apply. And I'm saying, no, you're wrong. It really does. And so those people in Kaaba want to know why. And I say, there's a systemic change that has to happen with your company. Now, can you do other things? and we'll talk about what corporations are doing. Yeah, but it is, is, is it the same as really true philanthropy? Philanthropy is defined, right, as the loving of humankind. Doesn't sound like a hard thing to do, right? But it is for some corporations. And so when social models are built for me, right, when these social models emerge and they start as that, it's sort of in their DNA. And so it's just something interesting to think about. So fast forward a little bit and say, OK, we're here in the United States. It's the Industrial Revolution, and Hershey comes along. Hershey's a confectioner, right? He's, and, but he's also a philanthropist. He's somebody that cares about humankind. And so he basically started a Hershey, a, a Hershey and in, in an effort to help community. In fact, he helped community so much that he built a community. He built Hershey, right? I mean, there, there's a whole town that he built. Now, people could minimize that, but what happened was during the Great Depression, he, nobody was buying chocolate. Okay? It was the last thing on people's list. So what he did was is he said, I'm gonna, I have all these people that I am responsible for. Okay, how many people do, how many companies do that, right? And he said, I'm gonna, ha I'm gonna build this community. And he started to build real estate in Hershey. He built, he built an orphanage, he built an industrial school for boys. All of this stuff was basically, not that it was unneeded, but it was somewhat unnecessary. And he did that to keep all the people that worked in his factory making chocolate that were, couldn't make chocolate anymore employed. Okay, so when you think about now, now look at Hershey. Does anybody know where, who, who owns Hershey? The Hershey Foundation foundation owns the entire thing. It's run and operated by a foundation. So all the money they make goes into, goes into societal, uh, societal needs. OK, so now enter Milton Friedman. And I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong to all of the academics. But everybody know Milton Friedman's theory? What's Milton Friedman's theory? Anybody? Come on, somebody here. No business school people here? You've got to learn about Milton Friedman, right? Anybody? No? Really? No? OK. Um, he was, he was a believer in capitalism, no doubt about it, as, as am I. I'm, I'm a strong believer. I think that capitalism can resolve a lot of the problems that we have in, our, in, in, in the U.S. today, including social ills. But basically, and I, I, but I also think we're at a point where we need, probably need to reinvent capitalism a little bit. Um, but it is really an unparalleled way to meet human needs, um, improving efficiency. It creates jobs. And yes, it actually does build wealth, which is what Milton was about. So the theories of Friedman and others during that time basically have led to corporate culture the way it is today, which is we need to drive money to shareholders. So if you think about policies and you go to apply to be a corporation and you, you, you adopt the articles in, of incorporation that are on, that are in the Delaware website, right? What it's going to say is the primary objective is to drive money to shareholders. Now, you look at my company, and I'm a C Corp. I'm not a B, I'm B certified, but I'm not a B Corp, because back then there was no such thing as B Corp. So the B certification, when people were applying for it, they said, they said well, I really can't do this because I'm, I'm obligated under the current laws, under the policies and regulations of, our, of the United States, of these individual states, to drive my, my primary objectives, to drive money to shareholders. 
we made, in the CPA firm last year, we made about 50 million gross, 15 million net. We gave away $5 million, 10% of our gross every year. Since the first year I started, first year I started $90,000, we gave away 9,000. So this year, last year, like, so in 14, we counted in 14, we do it in 15. So in 15, $4.5 million of pro bono skilled services, $500,000 of hard dollar support for community, right? You can look at that and say, if I, if I went into my partners and said, we're going to make 15 million, but I'm only going to give you 10. The rest of them are going to give away. If I didn't build the company back in 84 this way, they would fire me. And they'd have every right to under the law, OK? Because I'm not driving that money to them. I'm doing something else with it. I'd have to prove that that 5 million I was doing was getting some kind of return to the shareholders. What I only thing I have to prove to my partners is we have impact. The impact is you make $10 million, we split it among 15 of us, and you can go and, and build a deck on the back of your house. That's your impact, OK? Wonderful stuff. I'm going to take these other $5 million, and I'm going to tell you stories about impact that's going to blow your mind and the stuff that we can do in the community with those kind of dollars. And if you don't believe it to be true, just start by giving a little bit of yourself, you know, that caring of humankind, that philanthropy. It's not those big wealthy guys out there like the Bill Gates of the world. It's honestly those people that let somebody in in traffic instead of flipping them the bird. I shouldn't do that in the classroom. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really it's those small little things that end up making civil society better. So when you look at when you look at Friedman and say, well, okay, if Friedman says, is there something, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? That's his quote. Okay, so you know that Wall Street movie didn't come from, it wasn't made up stuff. Um, where are you going to find these angels to organize society for us? Okay, so the truth is, is that during that period of time, there was a surgence of nonprofits, and it's grown over that period of time. So really, the nonprofits were the angels. They looked and said, in our society, there's these things that are just being disregarded that are societal needs. And so instead of for corporations looking at them and saying, you know, hey, there's, a, there's an issue around uh, not having enough playgrounds for children. Let's, let's get in the business of building playgrounds if we're Home Depot, right? Um, you know, they, they basically said, well, we're not really caring about that. We'd rather tell people they smell and sell them deodorant. And I know I'm being a little facetious, but that, that's, really what ha that's really what happened. And, and what it, what, if you look at it, it really is a lot around, you know, when people say, how do you run your company? What's the premise? It's always around long-term sustainability, not short-term profitability. And any time you make a decision based on short-term profitability, like what have you done this month, this quarter, this day, you know, then all those hard, those decisions that they become a lot harder. You know, you take, take wellness in my firm. We had people that, you know, we, we looked at at our, my insurance company. It's an insurance company I own, so we can get a lot of information. They said to us a couple of years ago, 20, your, your rates are going to go up 25%. I said, well, how much is that of the market and how much of it is us? Well, 67% of our people are under 32 years old. So we have a young group. We should have catastrophic illness rates of about 3 to 5. We had 27, okay? So we got a problem. So we go up $500,000. Now, most CEOs, again, not, not to say anything, but they're bound by this short-term financial success that, they, that John Toops that had to report his earnings every quarter. He basically would have to say, cut some of the benefits, right? Cut, cut the benefits, get me back down so I don't have to spend the extra $500,000. What I said was leave the benefits the same and let's put in a better wellness program. What do we spend on our wellness program? $60,000. let us spend a quarter of a million dollars. Let's get people well. Okay, in the long run, our insurance costs may go down. They may not. But what is better than a healthy, happy workforce, right? I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about reporting my people being good accountants or good technology people. I'm, I'm interested in being better human beings. I just want everybody that works for me to become a better person. And when you look at it that way in a much, much holistic way, it becomes an easy decision to make. So nonprofits sort of filled this void, which is where I jumped into and learned a lot from nonprofits. But really, if you think about the big problems that exist in communities today, um, I think it's really these, these corporate leaders that are trapped in this really outdated value proposition, where they think that if they do this, somehow driving that profitability is all they really should be concerned about, like, like Milton professed. And I, and, I, and I totally disagree with that. I think if you look at the Fortune 500 companies right now, the average life expectancy of a Fortune 500 company is about 50 years. Okay? I'm 62. I'm outliving most of the companies that have this as a model. Okay? 
It's an outdated model. It does, if you really want to sustain yourself over a long period of time, you've got to think about not bleeding your suppliers. You've got to think about helping your suppliers. I have a, I have a coffee store. It was started because I, did a, I helped a co-op down in Salvador, and they started to produce too much coffee. So now we own zombie coffee and donuts all over the damn city. So, you know, and like, so people say, how do you get into coffee and donuts? Like, well, that's a whole other long story. But, you know, it's because I wanted to f f f fulfill a societal need. And am I making money? Sometimes. They're not, not, not as profitable as I'd like them to be, but they're okay. So, you know, I think, you know, when you start to look at that, and it's that longer term, I think there's, there's all of a sudden, this, this model changes a little bit. And corporations can be very, very different and do, and do, and, and do much, much better. So, I think part of it is, is there's this presumed trade-off between economic efficiency and social progress. Okay? You can't have both. And I, I don't believe that to be true. It's been really institutionalized in decades of policies that have been set by the government, too. So I'm not paranoid, but I'm, I'm just observant. I think that you know, if you enter the social movement as we see it now, um, where the solution may be in creating economic value in a way that also creates value for society, um, businesses may look to create products that, and services that address societal needs. And so it seems really sort of simple to me in a way that business is being restructured. Okay? So then you enter CSR. And you know, I'll probably, maybe the best thing to do is sort of pass this out. I, I remember giving this speech in, in, at, a, at a place and my wife, who never sees my speeches, was sitting there. And later we were talking about somebody, we were at dinner and somebody said, you know, um, what, what did you talk about the other day? And I went into this whole tirade about Tata and you know and and everything. She says to me, "That sounds really familiar." And I said, "Well, yeah, it's the speech I gave three days ago." She said, "Oh, that's when you gave out that really good slide." So, <laughs> the only thing she remembered was the slide. So you got to go away with something here. Let's pass that around. Yeah. You know, I'll keep one of them so you can see. So basically, you know, the way I see it, this is sort of my 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 thoughts really in a nutshell, is that. Um, this slide sort of speaks for itself. What, what's happened is, is that CSR has sort of been forced on people, right? So you end up, it ends up coming from a, from a different place. Like, why do I do what I do? Because it makes me feel good. I mean, no CEO really has that kind of betterment, I don't think, unless they really start from scratch like this and it becomes in the DNA. But that's why I do it. I don't look for a return. I understand why corporations do, and we have a CSR services department that helps corporations like we do in India focus on you know, return on investment, cause marketing, staff retention, all these different kinds of things. But, you know, and, and we have evidence that, like for instance, we give people off as much time as they want for community service. Okay? Any day they want to take off, they just check with their team. You know, they have to be responsible, just like you do to your family. You're not going to tell your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wife or your spouse that, you know, I'm leaving for the week and I'm going to Vegas without sort of checking in, right? So they, there's a responsibility there. But they can take off as much time as they want. You know, we're, we're CPAs. We track our hours. We have one of the highest average hours billable time in the country, right? So maybe it's about 1,600 average billable hours, 1,700. I don't even know because I really don't track much of this stuff. I don't really care about it that much. But that's what they tell me. That's what's in this IPA survey. Okay? So while I know that retention is really good in the firm, it's at 2%, I know that, I know that, um, uh, that, that, that basically I have happier employees for doing this, and they find a sense of purpose in the work that they're doing. I know that they're able to integrate their work with their life a little bit better instead of trying to balance it. Right? Everybody says work-life balance. That, Indicative of conflict, right? Work-life balance, right? So I, I don't want to. I don't want one of my one of the women that work for me to say I, I'm going to wait to be a manager before I have a baby. I mean, I I, I don't want to direct any of that, right? So you know, part of this is to say, you know, when I go and speak to people, they say I can't do that. That's just ridiculous. If I went back to my partners and said, everybody take off as much time as they want for community service, I can tell you that not only does it help with retention, but empirically, the people that have the higher numbers, the, the billable hours of 18, 1900 hours, they're the people who have. 300 hours of community service. So you can be said that I don't lose a dime. In fact, I'm making money because the people that are down on the lower end and billing 1,200 hours don't have the community service because they're not committed generally as human beings. They're not engaged generally. They're looking for ways out. And those are the people that don't necessarily survive with us. So you know, they're in that 2%, which is just fine with me because I don't need everybody to drink the Kool-Aid, but sure is nice when they do because they sort of get it. right? So you know, if you think about people sort of jumping into that in a deep end, I think you sort of lose, you, you, you start to see this whole thing of like greed, right? So you say, 
maybe not a lot of you guys remember. You guys remember the Exxon Valdez at all, right? Okay, so Exxon didn't do much about it. They managed a few things, right? Now you see BP, right? Why do you think BP did spend billions of dollars, right? It was firm image. They went into a, they went in, I, I used to do this for a living. You go into a, a board meeting and you say, this is why we have to do this. Okay, we have to manage our image. Or we want to promote something. BMW in the Olympics, right? That, how many times, do you guys all watch the Olympics? How many times do you see that BMW commercial that says, with our customers, we, we're going to give $1.5 million to the Olympics? It's like $1.5 million. This is a billion dollar company. That's like, that's nothing. They're spending five times as much on the commercials. But why? Because it's an image. We all sit there and go, oh, maybe I'll buy a BMW next time, right? So they look at it and there's a return on investment. There's nothing wrong with it. I teach, I teach corporations how to do it because I'll get CSR, I'll get so social responsibility any way I can. I'll, I'll beg, borrow, and steal for it. So I don't have any problem working with companies to say, this is the return of investment you're going to get. It's going to take a little bit longer than one quarter, but you're going to get this, right? Um, and then basically, so that's, that's really around that corporate philanthropy and managing it, but it's also like you know, sort of a travel and expense thing, right? Things get tough and corporate philanthropy stops. Okay, so what, what, what doesn't stop when, 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 when the economy's bad? It's interesting, what goes up is individual philanthropy. <coughs> Because people that give, give from a heart, okay? They don't, they're not logically thinking about it in some economic way. And when you do that, I think you also sort of distance your customers because customers in the know are going to know, well, they're not really into that. They just want to be able to say, I think there was another thing with Wells Fargo. I get in trouble. Like I did a newscast one time, and I named somebody, and it was ExxonMobil, and they called me and said, you yeah, got to stop talking about us like that. So I probably shouldn't use names, but I think it was Wells Fargo that said, in the past five years, we've given away $3 million. It's like, you guys make, like, look at their numbers. It's so ridiculous. But anyway, I'll get off of that. So philanthropy becomes one of these things where it's sort of this give and take. And you know, I had, I had these students from Georgetown that, were, that wanted to, uh, they were front, they they were they did a the Peace Corps thing in Ethiopia. The women there don't have feminine hygiene products, so they can't go to school or they can't go to work. Okay, when they have their periods, so every every you know this is this is like a big issue. Most of the males there don't really give a crap because and anything they sell is expensive. So you're buying five cents for kerosene, you're not going to spend twenty cents on a feminine hygiene product. So they came back, and I was connecting them to Colgate Palmolive because I race cars, and I race with this guy that's the president of Colgate Palmolive. And I said, "Hey, you know, would you do this?" And he said, "Sure. You know, we've got some excess inventory. We'll knock you." And, and these guys said, "No, we're not. We don't want to take it." I said, well, "Yeah, in your mind, I figured they were a nonprofit. Turned out this is this is a true story. They they said, "No, we're going to source it from a foreign source that cents on the dollar." They trained males that were selling the kerosene to sell to the men. And now they're about to build a factory in northern Africa to keep it in the community, right? And they are returning about 6 or 7% to their investors. Not 30%. Okay, it's not venture capital money, but it's darn good. When I wrote the check out to, their, to, their, to the venture guys that gave the money, they never expected a dime back. They said, keep the money. Just reinvest it. They honestly did. Because they, you know, they, were, they, were, they were social investors, and you know, they were still investors, and they're, still, they're not exactly philanthropists. I always say social investing is the gateway drug to true philanthropy because it sort of gets them hooked, but they're not quite there yet. They still want to see some return. And they want, but more than that, they want to have impact, which is a little bit what these corporations want to have when they start talking about it. Then you talk about corporate citizenship, right, and... and and, and how these people phase into corporate citizenship. And then all of a sudden, you know, this creating of shared values, you get somebody like Tom's that's shoe for shoe, right? Does everybody know the story of Tom's? I know those guys really well, so I can talk about them. They, they actually disrupted economies because they gave away shoes. So, you know, you also have to be careful when you do your philanthropy. So they, 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 instead of like manufacturing them locally or buying them from a local manufacturer, they went in and dumped shoes. You're only getting the shoes once, okay? So these people need shoes later, and the economies there got sort of disturbed. So there's another guy, Soapbox Soaps, and those guys are doing all things differently, and they're, they're one of my friends and clients. And so we've sort of learned from that, too. So people are getting better at it. And then all the way to the end, which is you know, this, this social impact and looking at societal needs. So that, that, to me, is sort of the history of all of that. So for all of you guys that are thinking about this stuff, right? and every time I teach an entrepreneurial class, I was joking earlier, the guy, Jeff Reed, that runs the entrepreneurial program at Georgetown will say, come and teach on, and tell, these are all startups, tell them what kind of entity they should be. 
I, I, I always sneak in this whole thing of purpose. Like, what's your purpose behind what you're doing? And, you know, every once in a while, it's like, I want to make a lot of money. And, you know, it's purpose. I mean, if you think about it, I don't, not, not a lot of you guys probably have pension plans at this point, but like a lot of my people on the, on, do. And when, but you, if you have a savings account or anything, it's still a good example. When you get your monthly statement, what do you look at when you look at your monthly statement for any money you have invested? Return, right? How much money you made, right? Last month, last year. Right, right, right. What did you do this last quarter? What did you do this? You know, so we're all victims of this, right? We're looking at I do it. I said, what, what did my wealth management company make for me, right? That's impact. That's what you want. Okay, now, if you knew that, and again, I'll be a little facetious, that you made money because there's kids in China that are nine years old that are working until 12 o'clock to manufacture the shirts that are in the company you invested in, would you care that you made a 15% return as opposed to a 10% return? You'd say, no, I'd rather take the 10% return. I don't want to advocate for these people. So you know, that, that, it, that impact happens to all of us, and we have to think about it. So when I go to these classes and I say, What's, what is your purpose? What impact do you want to have? There's, there's you know, it's Georgetown. There's 60% of the people say, I want to make a lot of money. That's what my goal is. Okay? I would contend that you do that, and that's great. Then where are you? You know, and, I, and I honestly have clients that I deal with that are foundations and you know, very, very wealthy philanthropists, and they'll say, I can make more money on this $10 million in my lifetime than any nonprofit can, so I'm going to invest it, I'm going to make it, and then when I drop dead, you can give it all away for me. I mean, I've had a client that says that. It's like, that's no fun. You should give it away now. It's really a lot of fun to give it away now. Um, or I, I, you know, and so this, this social thing that's happening really is a matter of saying, well, I'm a business person. I don't like to just give my money away. and have the YMCA not tell me about their impact, not tell me what the stories are, not be able to have measurements. And somehow these social businesses sort of fit into this model that basically you may get these people that, that are there. So I sort of talked to the people at Georgetown about whatever you're doing. We met with somebody yesterday that was talking about the student loan dilemma, right? And he had a software app on how to like redirect your loan. So like most people don't know if you, if you teach at a school, you actually get discounted so you get some of your student loans forgiven if you work for the government. They don't know that. It's so confusing. So he's going to do an app around that. And I said to him, you, you, this is a social mission. You know, now you're, this is a societal need that is very disruptive. You've got all these people that they can't buy houses. They, they stall getting married maybe. I mean, because they're burdened with, with, with student loans. You may have a kid and say, I want to start saving for the co my, my kid's college, but I've got to pay off my student loans first for my college, right? So if you can fix that problem, it's, it, it's okay that there's money in it because it's sustainable. Um, but it's something to think about in terms of like when you're formulating your ideas about business, is there another aspect of it that is social? And if there is, drive to that aspect because to me, there's a whole other area of, of investment for that. Okay? So it's really, you know, I, you know, part of this is to, to ask people to take on the challenge. To have business sort of, again, earn the respect of society and not be us so skeptical like I am here. I'm probably worse than anybody. But, you know, it doesn't keep you from have, having to have a good product. You know, it doesn't matter that Paul Newman gives away all of the profits to people. If he has crummy salad dressing, nobody's going to buy it. So I still have to be the best accountant on the planet. But I can be the best accountant for the world as opposed to the best accountant in the world. And that's really what my goal is. And so if you think along those lines, I think there's also new, new areas of development for revenue sources as well. So that's really, in a nutshell, what my hope was for the future of social entrepreneur and really for the future of the planet. So that takes you there. Now, I'll just stop. I was asked to talk about Social Impact 360, but I'll wait. Questions? Because my answers are always long and rambling. So, so you mentioned D Corps. Yeah. You said that um, you sort of alluded that it was difficult for existing corporations because of uh, legal requirements to transition to adopt that sort of what are some of the ways that they can potentially do that? It's, um, it, 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 one of the things I like about the B certifications, and I tell people to go to it, there's, a lot, there's still a lot of problems with it, but I think it's, it's a good metric, and it's a good community to be a part of, even if you're not in it and you're not certified. Um, so they measure you on governance, on all, all sorts of things. So like, for instance, one of the things that we can't do as a CPA firm is we can't have people on our board from the community. They have to be CPAs, and they have to be partners in the firm to be on our board. So we already, we already lose those points. So there's a lot of things that don't really fit, you know, even, even a corporation like mine as advanced on, in a social mission as we are. 
But I think what it, what it does is, is it, makes, it gives you pause to think about some of the things you can do. So when I did it, it wasn't so I could say I'm be certified and you know, I'm really not like that. It was more for me to say, how can I be better at what I'm doing? If somebody else can measure me, how can I be better? And one of the things that I learned was that while we're environmentally sound in our office, we're not, we, we weren't really looking at vendors as the, in the same way. So we weren't saying, what are you guys doing that's environmentally profound? Like, did you guys hear the thing that Apple's doing with the bag? And they just did a patent? They, they, when, you, when, you, when you do bags with recycle, anything more than like 40, 50%, the bags fall apart. They rip. So they invented this thing of way to fold the bag where they can have 60% recycling in it and, it could, and the bag will still hold up. And they, they patented it. I don't know if they're going to call it the eye bag or not, but, they'll, but they're patented. <laughs> so, so, you know, you think about something like that and say, is that, is that a vendor I want to be associated with? And so, I, but I'm sure, and again, not to be cynical, they're sitting there going, this is an Apple image, right? I, you know, if we, if we promote this and we get the marketing out that we're doing this, that, we're, that we've actually spent dollars and money and we're going to get it patented, will you feel like iPhone's a bet, I, Apple is a better company? Probably. You know, I, I, I contend that it has to come from the heart. But so B certification is is there, and it is something that people can move toward. Um, I think we're talking to a group that's starting businesses. Just look at it. It's really hard to to get all of those things in order. Um, it's also expensive um, for established companies. It's a little cheaper for smaller companies, startups to get there. It's like a five hundred dollar for us. It's like twenty thousand. Uh, but but I think it does give you some good model and some things to think about. And I think when it's done early on, which is why I'm here tonight, I mean, it really is getting you folks to think about it early on as opposed to my other work, which is going into, you know, we don't work with ExxonMobil, but going into, you know, a company that's, start, that's trying, like a Kenneth Cole is trying to do sustainable fashion. So we're working with Kenneth and we're like, you know, and we're trying to get them focused and everything. But there's, there's hurdles. I mean, you know, you know, the, the honest truth is, is, especially in fashion, people want really cool stuff for not too much money, right? You know, and so how, does, how do we make it so that his brand is even cooler than anybody else's because it's sustainable fashion. It's not from a sweatshop in China or it's made in the USA or when they do the blue jeans, they don't put chemicals on them, they run them in stones. You know, I mean, all of those things I think are hard steps to take, but if you start early, and that's what the B certification I think does for you. Um, any other qu questions? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm guessing. Small. Is, this, is that what these are? Okay. Go ahead, next question while I'm doing this. Extra large, here you go. Thank you. Yes. Do you have some questions? Yeah, I can hear. Okay, good. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Do you look at CSR as being more about a company's investments? as needing to have employees that affect change. So I know that you talked about, um, you know, really encouraging your employees to go out and volunteer and whatnot, but do you think that that's required to be a successful company in the corporate social responsibility realm? Yeah, I, I, let, me, let me see if I can answer it, and in, 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 if I don't hit it, let me know. I think. It's something that has to be sincere. That's what I was trying to get across. And when it is, it permeates everything. I have two of my employees here, so maybe they can attest to it. Maybe they'll scoff at me. But I, I really care about people coming here and finding this sense of purpose, OK? And finding this work-life integration. Like, we, as a society, we operate in silos, right? You've got your life. If you're religious, you've got your spirituality. If you're not, you've got your me time. That's more me. It's not going to church, but it's, you know, it's, it, you've, got, you've got your community if you care about community and community involvement, right, which may be volunteering or maybe the church or something. And then you have work. And we operate in silos as if they're all sort of different. And in a lot of ways, we've made them that way. If you think about what I care about is, is having those people sincerely sort of find this sense of balance where it all sort of merges together, which means you sort of eliminate this restraint on time, like where I'm trying to get all my partners to forget about PTO. It doesn't really matter anymore. It's like, you know, and so how, how does that happen? I've got, 
I've, somebody comes up and says to me after a staff meeting when I'm talking about this, they'll say, she said, I really, I love the idea, but I don't get it. And I said, well, okay, well, tell, me what your, tell me what your issue is. Well, I've got my son, I don't see him enough, and he's special needs, and, you know, his classes are on Thursday and Friday, I haven't gone to the church very often, I've been working a lot, and, you know, and I know you want us to do community work. And I said, well, do you have a day where you could be a teacher's aide? She said, yeah, Thursdays and Friday mornings I could be a teacher's aide. Is it in your kid's school? Yeah. Um, one of the Friday class is catechism. It's like, well, take Thursday and Friday morning off and go and do that. Like, you just did four things that blend together. You just integrated your life. Okay, now not everything is that simple and it takes a lot of work. But I think it is about everybody. It's about... It's, it's not just about my employees. It's about my vendors. It's about having relationships with them. It's about community. If I, I'm working right now on a thing called Companies for Causes where I bring all these companies together and the social mission that we're trying to fix is in D.C., in Ward 6, Eastern High School that was just, they spent five years ago and reopened it from freshman year on. They spent $78 million on renovations. The dropout rate is 48%. 48%. It's it's four blocks from my office. It's, it's crazy. It's right next to the White House, for goodness sakes. It's, you know, so, okay, well, can we fix that social ill? I mean, you look at it and you say, if you don't fix it, if, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not hiring kids without a college degree. I don't really have any direct stake in it. I just do it because it feels good. It's the right thing to do. But at the end of the day, I have to do remedial training. I mean, at the end of the day, it still costs my company. If, if, if I can't survive, just, it's like a natural resource. Uh, this, this, a company can't survive in a community with ills. Look at what happened in Detroit. All these companies had to move out. GM had to build a tower with walls around it so that no, so somebody, so people could find their way to work without getting mugged. It's just, it, it, you know, I don't, I, to me, it's so clear. If you looked at a small town, like in, you know, out, out in Montana someplace, and you said there's a, plant there. In fact, the town I grew up in, there was a lily plant, which was not the, chem not, the, not the pharmaceutical, but the paper products, right? Everybody graduated high school. It's a small town, and they went to work for lily, right? If, 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 if lily doesn't pay attention to the town and nobody's graduating and everything, lily will go out of business, okay? If, if I'm a haberdasher there or I'm a, or I'm a hardware store and lily goes out of business, everybody moves out. My store goes out of business. So somehow there's a bigger connectivity to poverty, to homelessness, to drugs, to education in these in smaller towns. I don't know how we've lost track of that in a place like D.C. Simply because we're bigger, we have all those problems. They permeate. I see homeless people on the street all the time. I, I look at it and go, we've got, that's what we've got to fix because without that, I, I can't thrive. Okay, and, and, I, and I really don't do it for selfish motivations, but I do speak to other people about it. So yeah, it is very, very, to me, it's very holistic. And what I create for my people is this, is, is this place where they can, they can sort of take this balance in their life and not have this conflict all of the time. And to be very, very, very honest, I mean, all I really, it, it sounds really corny, I know it, and there's a lot, I get a lot of people when I speak, especially like at a professional conference, not with the students, I say, all I really care about is I just, whether they're there a day or they're there 10 years, I just want them to be better human beings. I just want them to have a better, a better life and be better people. Um, and so without that, I, I, that's where the insincerity happens. That's where... Companies say, like, I did, I did this thing for a company that had, you'll, you would know the name. It's a very large company. It's a consulting firm. They did, they, we, we convinced them, we, we have this unlimited community service, right? So last year, we get it every year. It's like this award from Washington Business Journal. The, t the number one in terms of no hours. Like, so in the CPA firm, 200 people, 14,000 hours, an average of 50 or 60 hours uh, for everybody a year, right? You get someplace like Lockheed Martin or some of the other places, and they have you know, 25,000 people, and they have less community service hours than we do. So, so this company said, we are having a lot of turnover. Give us some ways to do it. One of the ways we said was, let's do more community service. And what I feel like is, is that this kind of philanthropy is contagious. So the way I started was we did it as a firm. We still do for new people to come in because they don't really get it. So we walk for this. We're doing an LSS thing again this year. The whole firm's involved. And it's really great for you know, the community that is the firm. But what it does is it gets people sort of engaged and then they go out and do some of this stuff on their own, right? Same thing with wellness. You throw on a yoga, yoga, yoga class and people get better and they like the class and then all of a sudden they go and do a yoga class on their own, right? So it's all very, very contagious in a community setting. That, th that company came back and said to me, okay, we're giving people off two days. 
Uh, three with vacation. One of them had to be a vacation day that they took. What if we cut it back? Do you think our recruiting and retention would go down again? It would hurt it. And I said, yeah, I can't really tell you that. I mean, I don't have statistics around that. I mean, that's leading with the, with, with the profitability and the economics of it. And I think if you think about, if you think about um, there was this great article about, I think I may have pieces of it, about, um, what was the name of it? What Aristotle can teach about CSR. And so the German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, uh, argued people should act of, out, out of moral obligation, okay? So you see somebody on the street, like when I was in India, they have this whole other reason why they don't give because they believe that those people were bad in their other life, so that's why they, they're on the street corner with leprosy. But you, you, give, you give not because there's any empathy, but because you think you have to. It's a moral obligation. This poor guy has less than me. It's a moral obligation, right? That's a lot of CSR. The other is the, this person quotes Jer Jeremy Betham's utilitarian way, right? An English philosopher argued a unit-based approach. As long as outcome is bigger than the input, that's the return on investment, the action is justified, right? So profit-driven organizations see CSR as a unitarian purpose. If you look at it and say the missing link is emotion, what I was talking about, that you know, I do things because it feels good and it's an emotional thing, then the purpose, again, th that whole thing about the purpose, lead with the purpose, lead with the why, then that becomes much, much more meaningful. And to your customers, it does too. Will you feel good about aligning yourself with a business that you honestly thought and I, I don't do it for this. I just discovered it. I was doing it because it was, it, again, it made me feel good. But what I discovered was people generally cared about it, and they would prefer to do business with us than they might anyplace else. Now, when I say that in a big group like of other CPAs, they'll say, well, that's because you're doing nonprofit work. No, no, no. I'm doing nonprofit work because... Because I believe that, and I want to help. I, I want to help the society in needs. It's a circle, and it's the same thing. I spoke to a group of entrepreneurs about two or three years ago, and they said, "Well, of course you can give away 10% of your gross, and you can let all your people sit on boards and all this other stuff. You're making 50 million dollars a year in your company. Um, we're small startups. We need every penny to pay payroll." And I honestly had this revelation. I had never said it before, but it's it's really a true statement. I said, "I I am." I am a successful $50 million company because I was a philanthropist. Okay? I am not a philanthropist because I'm a $50 million company. And, that, and that's the distinctive difference. And you know, when you look back, that's the, that's the guy, that's Tata, and that's, um, and that, and that's Hershey. Yeah, question. So I understand company, like what you're doing, you give your employees time off to service. You're giving up a percentage of your How do you manage a, a company who's focused on social good? This issue of, well, wait a minute, you found a way to make money off of people who are using the street down, downtrodden? Or, you know, it's almost like the EpiPen issue that's come up. Great well. product. You know, interesting, my <laughs> daughter now who's on her own, you know, we were always giving her the EpiPen products, and now she's on her own. And we said, where's your EpiPen? She said, I can't afford it. I said, we said, what? You know, you've got these allergies. You just can't be. Right. She, put, she said, you know how much it's gone up? I mean, we were clueless because she was on her own. I mean, how do you balance a for-profit, maybe focused on doing something good and making money? What's, what's reasonable? Well, you know, I, you know, it's 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 back it's back to Milton Friedman. Greed. I mean, greed is good, right? I mean, like, yes. come on, come on. These, oh, okay. Well, you get you fire that stupid CEO is the first thing I would do if I was a shareholder. I mean, that that's excessive. I mean, and the truth is, is that you know, if there's if there is this need, one of the things that we do a lot of because of our success is we're able to give a lot back. And because of that, I hate giving back too, because I didn't steal anything. We just give. We don't give back. And I hate that. We're, I hate when they say we give. You got to give back. It's like I didn't take it. I didn't steal anything. I'm not giving it back. So, but but in all honesty, it's like you know, there's there's this balance. There's there's an overall need, and there's going to be a small nonprofit. Like one of the things we run out of our office is called the Catalog for Philanthropy. Has anybody ever seen the Catalog for Philanthropy? It's, it's, it actually started out about 10 years ago before there was a lot of internet and everything. It was, it was honestly a slick catalog. We took all the nonprofits that were friends that weren't client, paying clients, but they were clients. We were helping them. We were doing free pro bono services for them and helping them build capacity. And I said, one of the things that they don't have is they don't, they don't know how to market. They don't know how to brand themselves, and therefore they 
stink at fundraising, right? So it's this vicious circle. They can't pay us because of the fundraising. Again, I wasn't thinking let's make them money so they can pay me, but the truth is let's make them money so they can sustain themselves, right? So we put this catalog together. We vetted them all programmatically, and we vetted them all financially. We put them in the catalog, and we sent the catalog to all the high wealth zip codes in the city. It's been like 12 years. Last year, we raised $4.5 million for these small nonprofits. Overall, we've raised almost $48 million in that period of 10 years, right, for the catalog. And that's the stuff we can count. That's the stuff that comes through the catalog. Now, I sit on the board of United Way, so I'm not giving them a hard time, but we don't take any fee. Okay, we raise our own dollars. I do, we, we, our firm gives about a quarter of a million dollars to keep the thing going. They, they're housed in our office and all the rest of this stuff. So if you look at it, we're able to do that and then to me, I'm advancing the sector. Again, it's a holistic thing. So if I advance the sector of that I'm in, and I'm the nonprofit expert, then those people will eventually come to me. They might not, but eventually they will. I've done, I've done audits for people pro bono for years and years and years, and they finally get some money and they go to another audit firm to pay them. I mean, I, you know, it's not, it doesn't always work. It's not, you know, but if you do it for that, you're going to be extremely disappointed. But so I think the EpiPen thing to me is like the extreme opposite of corporate greed. It's like, how do we make money and how do we burden on the backs of people? Now, maybe there's a lot of people out there that can afford 500 bucks, but what, what about setting up a program for the people that can't, right? I mean, how much is enough money is really my question. That's why I tell, I mean, my partners are really good to me. They don't really give me a hard time, but if they ever did, I would say, how much is enough money? I mean, I just, I just sold uh, friends of mine that owned a ticket exchange company. We sold for 78 million. They were talking about a holdback in closing that would have been, that would have given them 75 at a holdback of three. And they were arguing, and I said to these guys, the, the, the other team left, the, the other buyers left the room, and I said, the difference between $75 million and $78 million is not $3 million. It's going to be so incidental in your lives. I mean, there's three guys splitting $75 million. Is it really? Just make the deal. Shut up. Like, you know, there was an old, there was an old Jewish man that, 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 owned a, that owned a car dealership in, in Miami uh, that sold Rolls Royces and everything. And I was trying to deal for one of my clients when I was very young. And he said to me, Tom, you know, after being there from 12 o'clock and asking him for one more thing on the deal, he said, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. And so, you know, I've always remembered that line, too. So... This guy's just being a hog, and hopefully somebody will slaughter him. Any question up there? Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. You know, in, integrity is at the core of everything. It's even, it's even like, again, I think it's something that we, as a society, when we, we look at purchasing and, and, and things more and more, we're looking to companies with integrity, even if we just believe they have integrity. I, you know, it takes, it, it's something that's learned over such a long period of time that's sort of like you build, this, you build this wall of integrity, and I don't know where the cracks happen. Like, I, I remember when Enron happened, you know, and we, we said, what made, you know, 2020 hindsight, what made that person at Arthur Anderson say this was okay to do? Um, I, I, I think, you know, the same way you build it up, it erodes that way. Like, I, I see sometimes my people saying, oh, that report, it's going to be to you Tuesday, and then it doesn't get there until Thursday. Then I see them saying, you know, that report, it went out Thursday, and they never sent it out, okay? I fire people for lying. I mean, I don't think, it's sort of like being half pregnant. I mean, you either have integrity or you don't. But it starts with this erosion. And when you look back at it and you say, how did it happen? It were these cracks in the wall that you just sort of chiseled at over a period of time. And then the whole thing collapses. And it's like, you look back and say, how did, look at Volkswagen. for good. I, mean, I, met, I met the guy that was like one of the VPs of Volkswagen. And he's, he's embarrassed for his company. We were at a cocktail party together. But he was, he was really, it was almost like he was talking about it a lot because he wanted to, he wanted to get it, get, just get it off, because you look at it and go, how does, a, how does like one of the largest companies on the planet that is one of the most recognizable and honored brands do something like, you know, change the, you know, I mean, this is, this is not one person that had a minor lapse. This is like, you know, the entire company had, there's guys on assembly line putting this stuff in, they had to invent this, they had, I mean, this is a whole project. And, you know, so I think part of the Wells Fargo thing, and maybe it's that way, and we could draw parallels to every other company, is, 
what is it that this what is it that you're setting the company up for what are my goals for my company my goals are impact right my goals are i want my community to be better because of the work that we do okay I, if I start telling people I need to make more money and I'm driving them in a different direction, and not that money is an evil thing, but then, then those kinds of decisions get made that, you know, we, we need to, you know, and, and all of a sudden all of the stuff gets lost. And it's like, to me, it's always like to what end? What's the end game here? What is it that you really need to do? How much money do you need? You know, is there, is, what's the difference between 75 and $78 million? It's like it's, it's really enough. And I think we as a society are changing, fortunately, because for a long time when I was growing up, we were demanding that. We were demanding that my friend John Toops made a duck buck 21 at the end of that quarter or we were going to fire him. Now you look at, I've got a job, I'm making a couple of million dollars a year, I've got a wife, I've got kids in school, and all of a sudden you're thinking, okay, if I just fudge the inventory number a little bit, earnings per share will go up three, you know, three cents and I keep my job. You know, and how does somebody later when they get caught, like in an end run, it's like, how does something like that happen? And, that, and that's how. And I think it's all of us. It's societal. It's, it's the way that we're structured. And it's years, I believe it's years of policy. I don't, again, I'm not an academic. But looking at it, I believe it's years of policy. It's you go, you set up a corporation. All you guys go set up a corporation. It's going to say in the bylaws and the articles, your number one thing is to drive profit to shareholders. Should that be a number one reason for a corporation? I want to be a good corporate citizen. Again, I want to be the best corporation for the world, not just in the world. Yeah, question. And we'll take one more. My yeah. I was, you hinted at some of the regulatory issues and that hinder a social mission. What are some of the things that are changing now or we need to champion as young entrepreneurs moving, it, moving forward? Well, the, the, the B Corps is a really good example of that. I mean, if you look, you know, uh, they're in 32 states, you know, seven, eight years ago, certainly when I started 30 years ago, there was no, not, even, not even a whisper of it. So, and, and the B Labs did that. They said, if we're going to do this, we really need to change regulation. It's interesting. There's a lot of things that are actually like that in social missions. Like when you talk about social startups, a lot of it is policy change. I mean, you can't, you can't do it without policy change. So like these guys that are doing the student loans, there's things that have to change within the student loan structure for them to be, really have impact. So while they're doing this over there, they've got to sort of be soliciting and petitioning the government to make change too. So I think it's hand in hand. And we have, you know, we, at least my generation, has driven this. And to some degree, we still do. I mean, I was, I was valuable at PwC because I made John Toops money, okay? And... It made Cooper's money. They paid PwC a lot of money for me to go out there, and then Cooper's paid me a lot of money. And then all of a sudden, everybody measures my well, my, my worth in terms of my wealth. And that, that I think, is, is I, I honestly, I am very optimistic. I think all of that's changing. I think there's, you know, people want to, you obviously have to have sustainable companies. You want to be around for a long time. Um, but I think that my legacy and my company, and I say this a lot, it's really the truth, is I, I, am, I, I don't have a vision. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I would never claim that. I think, I think there's no such thing as a visionary. There's probably prodigies, but you probably figure that out by your six years old. And a lot of my parents told me a pro I was a prodigy. They lied. So, <laughs> so they were just proud parents. So, you know, you never, but even, even prodigies, like Mozart, we can all agree was probably a prodigy, right? He worked, he had to rewrite his symphony six times, okay, before his sixth symphony, six times before people accepted it. So even he didn't know the marketplace. Maybe it was the perfect symphony, but we weren't hearing it, okay? So it changed. So to me, it's a matter of like just little experiments, right, that blow up in my face and they're not, they're not costing me a lot of money, and every once in a while, the ones that work. And so all of the other ones are just shoved under my desk, all of the disasters, right? Nobody sees that. So they only see the things that are working. And so my legacy to me is I throw pebbles in a pond, and some of these are going to turn into big, big waves. And they're not going to be credited to me at all, but it will. I, I really want to have that kind of influence on the planet. And I think if you guys are starting out that way, that's what you should think about. You should really think about, don't measure yourself against the person that's next to you or the business or GW or even the city of DC or the entire country. Try to be the best in the world at what you're doing. I mean, just look at it and say, you know, am I happy with what I'm doing? And when I'm waking up every day, do I feel really, really good about my life and what I'm doing? And I, I can honestly say I do. I'm a really happy person. If you haven't figured that out already. Yeah, question, and then we'll stop. And then we'll stop. Go, just one more, and then we'll, then we'll go. Sorry. Uh, you were kind of focused on it, like BMW marketing, like talking about like how the big yeah. company is marketing. Yeah. What is like a better avenue for companies to promote the CSO? 
Again, it's, I, I don't necessarily, I, I'll take it any way I can get it. I t I'll take BMW's million and a half. I, you know, I'll take the guys that say, come in for a test drive and you know, we'll give $100 to the charities. I think it's all good stuff. It is something that was never there 10 or 15 years ago. I think you know, if you really look at that chart that I gave you and you look at that end that is social impact, that's, that's the emotional aspect of it. That's not, there's not a lot of logic to it. I, we're, we're, we're in, um, in, my company in India is called Verdon. Real quick, you know, there's, a, there's an energy company there. They've got, you know, a million and a half to spend. They want to they wanna get up in northern India where there's no, no power or lights. There's farmers up there. Um, I can give them solar. If I can convince them to do solar and to invest, we can get a nonprofit that's producing 50 panels to produce 5,000. They go up there, we'll put blank, blank energy, it's called Bloom Energy, but Bloom Energy all over the panels. We'll, we'll send their employees up there to put the panels in with our guys to learn about solar, because right now everything is, everything's electrical there and hydro. And so you know, they'll go and do that, so they'll learn that. And you know, we, we predict in like two to three or four years, the farmers will double or triple their crop rotation, because the, the solar is going to take care of irrigation, lighting, and refrigeration. So you know, all of those things will help produce, keep the, get, get more of the crop to, to the market. Okay, so say instead of making 2,000, they make four or five or 6,000. Now they can buy solar replacement panels from Bloom Energy after the end of five years. You know, I'm fine with that. I can say you got cause marketing, you got employee engagement, and you got a return on investment. You know, I've been in, I've been in those boardrooms where all I want to know about is what's the bottom line? What am I going to do? What is it? You don't necessarily care about impacting society, but I'm fine with that if I can convince them to do that because at the end game, I've just, say, I've just, I've just helped, you know, couple hundred thousand people in northern India. So, cool. Okay, this gentleman's going to talk about social impact 360, right? We changed our name. Um, and before he does, I just want to give you a really brief outline of that. When I was preaching all of this stuff at Georgetown very early on, about eight or nine years ago, um, they weren't listening. I used to say, we need to enter, and I'd go and speak, and they'd say, and the, the whole, the, all of the classes wouldn't even know there was a nonprofit sector, right? So, they, they weren't really aware of it. So I was trying to introduce all of that. It was never working. I went to a case competition. I was asked to speak. At the end of it, there was a, there was a dinner. Everybody ate dinner. Everybody, everybody's waiting. Harvard, Stanford guys, right? And everybody knows what a case competition is, right? It was like, so they gave them a product and who made the most money on it. I have no idea why they asked me to speak because I was like, money doesn't matter, you know? And so everybody was totally bored and get this guy off the stage. <laughs> there was one guy in the back that had come from uh, the uh, Chimes, which is an acapella group that's historically been at Georgetown forever. He was the entertainment. He listened. He came, to, he gave me a card and said, can I see you? He took my card and said, I can see you the next day. And he came to my office and he said, I want to start this, this, this what, what we're going to explain, which is a fellowship, a social entrepreneurship fellowship for freshmen and sophomores, and I want to mentor them as juniors and seniors. So I said, great, how can I help? So long story short, they've been in my office for the past eight years. We've graduated 1,000 students out of the program. There's been a lot of successful businesses, but really what I care about the most is that they learn about a kinder, gentler business. That's really what I care about. So if they're in ExxonMobil, and they're 30 or 40 years old, maybe they'll remember what they went through in the fellowship and say, hey, you know, we can do this greener. So it doesn't have to be a startup of a business. So with that, I'm going to introduce my friend who is one an minute, advocate for it. One minute, go quick. Wow, you're really out on time. All you guys have to get out of here someplace? Oh, we have to get out of here. Okay. One minute. You got one minute. I'm sorry. Let's throw T-shirts out.